Wonderful. All right. Um, so in that case, shall we, maybe I can run through the questions first and then we can, uh, or Prima, would you be interested in introducing the workshop briefly? I mean, I was just thinking maybe we can get the audience to introduce themselves when we wait for one. Sure. Do people from the audience want to say a few words about themselves? Okay, I can begin. I'm Arturo Macias. I work at Central Bank of Spain and I am also a PhD candidate in the Madrid University of Online Education. And I have interests in governance, finance, and anything related to the to the creation to uh, decision um, uh, game theory and reverse game theory. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, Pablo. Hi, uh, my name is Marco from the UK. Uh, together with a colleague. We're currently conducting a me multimedia project, uh, which is about telling the stories of democratic innovations from all over the world, with a slightly more focus on the global south, um, not just geographically, but more, let's say, the, the peripheries of the global political economy, um, and looking at what grassroots alternatives and innovations are happening right now that are maybe a bit away from the, the mainstream headlines. Um, and look at the, the variety of options that's, that's out there, whether that's uh, communes or cooperatives or social movements. But a big part of that, obviously, um, is what's happening in the sort of more tech scene, as it were. Um, hence why we're super interested to listen to what people have to say at this, this conference to see what's, what's going on there. Sweet. Welcome, Michael. I guess I, I might as well just introduce myself as well. Uh, I'm Josh. Um, I'm normally a PhD student uh, in computer science at Oxford, but currently I am uh, away in the US because uh, of coronavirus. Um, and I help run with Prima uh, this project called the Meta, Meta Governance Project. Uh, and we were also co organizers with Juan, who is also based in the US, so it's around 5 a.m. right now, which is why he's a little bit late, I believe. Um, uh, a workshop at uh, Harvard Law School called The Building Blocks of Web 3.0 that Prima will introduce uh, just a little bit later. Um, and uh, I'm Prima Vera. I'm a researcher at um, the CNRS in Paris. Um, and I'm faculty associate at the Bergman Klein Center at Harvard. And um, my research is mostly on the legal uh, implications of uh, new decentralized technology and um, um, AI. And uh, I'm looking in particular about um, how those new technology, in addition to all the legal challenges that they raise, uh, how do they provide potentially new governance, uh, but at the community level and at the global level. Um, yeah, that's about it. Cool. Um, so I think maybe I'll just um, try sharing my screen to see if this works. There's all sorts of fancy, fancy schmancy technology that we're going to try, see if this works in an online workshop. Um, let me share my screen here. How do I do this? Share screen. All right. So um, let me just, I'm kind of like the tech support right now. Um, so first off, hopefully everybody sees this, this question. We're going to try to try to engage you guys a little bit. We know it's, uh, or certainly it's early in the morning over here on the East Coast. Um, I, I think in the UK it's like 10 a.m., right? Um, we are using this website called Menti. Uh, so if you go to menti.com and sort of enter in that code, which I hope you see up at the top there, uh, 
you can actually vote on these sort of small questions. So we thought I'd just, uh, uh, if you can, so just try going to menti.com and using that code. Um, so uh, this will, we, we have this question here just to kind of introduce the topic a little bit. Um, it's actually a, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's a question that actually was asked by Gallup and the Knight Foundation about people's sort of interests in, uh, oh, there's one, um, uh, about the uh, governance of the internet. And I thought it'd be a kind of a good one to have, okay. <laughs> Nobody wants <laughs> Facebook to govern themselves. Um, uh, to kind of peg maybe the audience here versus what we're used to seeing online. Oh, really interesting. Oh, okay, okay, that seems more normal. Actually, don't let me be, don't let me bias you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, great. People are, seems actually, oh, wow. Now I'm surprised. Well, am I surprised? <laughs> <laughs> that bit does. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, this, this is, is my depending on what you say. That's true. Okay. Well, um, okay. Let's run this for. Uh, okay. So everybody sees this. I just want to make sure everybody actually sees what I'm seeing here. So there's five people voting for the government right now, and five people voting for major internet companies. Um, and that seems to actually go pretty well with. Let's see. What uh, people actually um, have voted, at least Americans. Uh, have responded to a broad survey. So about 55% of Americans believe that major internet companies should be moderating online content, uh, whereas about 44% uh, believe that the government should. So we have actually have, seems to have a fairly representative example from, you know, just inside our own little group here. So keep, keep going. Um, now, what do you think about this question? Do you think major internet and technology companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. Okay, too much power currently. Uh, too much power, too much power, too much power. I guess maybe we wouldn't be here if we thought they had the right amount of power. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, that seems to make pretty much sense. Uh, so yeah, so indeed, like yourselves, most Americans do think, uh, once again, this is Americans, think tech companies have too much power. Um, so 70, 70% of them think uh, they have too much power and 90% uh, think they have the right amount of power. Let me see. Actually, I just want to go backwards. Did I update? No, okay. Uh, all right. And lastly, we wanted to ask you what you think without any sort of background, uh, or unless you've read the homework, uh, which would be, um, which we'll discuss sort of um, once we get further into the presentation, what you think about the current state of the web and the internet. Uh, so the first question asks, how would you describe the current state of the web? and it asks you to rate that along kind of two ways, how centralized or decentralized it is, and how much government intervention you think there is uh, or applies currently. This is a little bit more comp of a complicated question, uh, so I'll give people a little bit more time to think about, uh, think about it and respond. So, by the way, um, I just want to encourage people to kind of interrupt and suggest things at any one time, um, or just pop up with questions, uh, because I think it's a kind of more interesting sort of discussion. Uh, a lot of like all these questions and all these like sort of like engage interaction or polls, uh, they're really here to kind of facilitate interaction. 
Oh, interesting. This is really fun, actually. We have a fairly widespread here. Some people think it's really centralized and that the government doesn't intervene at all, whereas others, well, okay, so we're mostly on this top left quadrant and we wanna be here at this bottom, bottom left quadrant. Oh, man, I love data, actual data we would get to see. All right, um, so I'll leave that there for now. We'll kind of engage uh, over the course of this workshop. Um, I think we'll engage with that problem, with this question, what is the state of the web and what the web should be um, in multiple ways. For now, let me just turn this to Prima. Um, we can introduce uh, the actual kind of workshop in the context that we're asking these questions in. Yeah, I think we can also, uh, Juan just got in, so maybe Juan can very shortly introduce himself as well. Of course, uh, good morning and, and good, good day to all of you. Um, my name is Juan, Juan Ortiz. Uh, I'm originally from Argentina. I'm an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, I'm also working with uh, a group called Tierra Común and another one called Just Labs. Um, and we've been working together with uh, Joshua and Primavera on a number of issues around the questions of narratives, centralization and, and decentralization. So with that, back to you, Prima. Thank you. Um, so you can skip the slide. Um, okay, yeah, uh, so basically the idea here is um, we, we organized this previous workshop uh, at Harvard and um, we the, the idea was kind of to uh, build upon um, the Declaration of Independence of the Cyberspace from uh, Barlow um, in order to, I think you need to click the slide, kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, in order to draft um, a Declaration of Interdependence, um, mostly because we've seen how uh, the internet has evolved and uh, today the internet, it's, it's almost ridiculous to see it as a autonomous and independent space because it has become a tool that uh, has, uh, has become part of everything. Um, and therefore talking about independence doesn't really much sense as much as looking to the extent in which it creates um, interdependence between all those different actors and therefore internet governance becomes inherently like uh, a question of interdependencies. Um, and of course, while the declaration of independence could be written perhaps independently by one person, uh, we felt that the declaration of interdependence was something that had to be written collectively uh, by all, all the cyberspace uh, population, which includes internet users, which include governmental actors and uh, private um, companies. Uh, I think you can move to the next. Yeah, so in order to achieve that, we thought that the best way would be to organize a workshop and inviting the various stakeholders and, um, and try to think together to brainstorm um, how did we move from the web 1.0, um, which was this more open, less um, internet, and, and then to the web 2.0, where all of a sudden we've seen this progressive centralization, concentration into large, a few large operators, and therefore like this more monopolistic um, and like locking of users into those big platforms, the network effect and so forth. And so this permissionless uh, network, which remains permissionless in many ways at the technical level has become highly, highly uh, difficult to compete um, on, on, on a level playing field. And so the question that we wanted to raise is how can we envision uh, the web 3.0, which actually get uh, the benefits of the open and decentralized network from the web 1.0, um, that also gets the more cooperative, collaborative, and like read-write 
approach of the web 2.0, but doesn't come with also the cost of centralization, surveillance, and uh, top-down control. Um, and so our, uh, the way in which we somehow leaned into was this vision of like the decentralized web, as in like creating, bringing back the centralization into the network and then all the issues, of course, that come because when we move and it's actually very interesting how the answer were because it seems that everyone wants to be where there is very little centralization and little governmental intervention. Um, but the problem is that, of course, when we have little centralization, then we don't have the moderator. We don't have those entities that are actually making sure that the content is uh, suitable for everyone, uh, that the governance is done properly, that uh, privacy is also done, etc. So basically, by removing this private um, and centralized entity, then that match that need to be addressed. And so while the, while the vision of the decentralized web 3.0 is really attractive, then we also need to think about all the governance that comes with it. Uh, and so that was the idea. That was what we spent a lot of time at the workshop doing. Um, you can skip to the next slide. And then, and then after the workshop, so the idea was let's all collectively collaborative write down this manifesto uh, for the web 3.0. And, and as we started this process, we realized that um, actually there is so many different visions of what the cyberspace is and what the web should be, uh, that we realized that our vision of the web 3.0 was actually just one out of many visions that was driven by our own uh, ideals and values of decentralization, uh, but it's not the only one. And so we started looking at the various narratives, the various manifestos, um, the various declarations that had been written before, and we realized that uh, there is just as many vision of cyberspace as there are people or stakeholders. Um, and each one of them, of course, are envisioning the web 3.0 in a way that will further their own interest. So maybe you can skip to the next slide. So we, we identified uh, as a preliminary way uh, four main narratives that, um, that we will discuss. Uh, so the first one is the libertarian narrative, which is um, no governmental intervention and more these uh, laissez-faire approach where the market uh, somehow will self provide what the user uh, really need. So by eliminating completely any possible intervention, we will see, we will, we will come up with like the internet that we want. And this is actually uh, closer to perhaps the, the initial vision of John Perry Barlow with the, with the declaration of independence of the cyberspace. Um, you can skip. Then we have the more corporate narrative, uh, which is actually uh, the one that is promoted by a lot of the, the, the private sector, uh, where there is this vision that uh, private companies are providing a service and those services are provided mostly because there is like advertisement uh, as, um, as, a, as an economic model, but they're also providing those service for free. And, um, and there is this vision that the, the, the internet is actually like a marketplace. And um, basically either we need to charge user on a subscription model or there needs to be like some advertisement based system, but basically that the private sector is the one that will establish the rules. So, large companies that are actually operating the internet um, or that are providing services on, on the web are the ones that will somehow dictate the governance of those platforms and consequently the governance of the internet. Um, next slide. And then we have this more what we call the interventionist narrative uh, for lack of a better word. And uh, here the idea is that we, 
we see, well, the people that abide by this narrative see the internet as this uh, commons resource or as some kind of like public good or general interest um, thing. Um, they believe that the market by itself will not be able to lead to exactly what people really want because there is market failures and because there is like dominant powers and so forth. And then there is a need for some type of intervention and whether this intervention should come from the state, whether this intervention requires more governance, more multi-stakeholder type of governance, um, whether these require an actual collective to come together and realize like there is like a polycentric mechanism of influences, um, reciprocal influence and so forth, but basically realizing that this is a common resource and that this resource requires some type of intervention that goes beyond just market approach. Um, and then the last one. So the, the last one is more the nationalist narrative, which uh, is kind of like the ex extreme version of interventionism with regard to the government and uh, basically the narrative that the government is there to protect the people, to decide what is public order and so forth. And uh, that therefore the internet should be controlled uh, by the government and the government should be one, the one dictating uh, how the governance of the internet should be, what content goes on which platform and so forth. Um, next one. And so, and so of course those are just like four archetype of uh, narratives because in reality there is like an infinity of possible location on those two axes in which we can find, find ourselves. And so we identify those two axes as being like determinant factor in order to locate those different narrative. And of course we can try and find more axes, but basically one is like the level of centralization. Um, who decides who makes those rules and then the level of governmental intervention. So to which extent do we want intervention from the state? And so if you, if you go to the next slide, we, we try to locate uh, those narratives. Of course, some of those narratives are also overlapping with each other. Um, but basically, so if we look at the answer that we had, uh, it seems that many people think that today the internet is controlled mostly by corporate powers. Uh, and most people think that we, we should be in a more libertarian uh, narrative section. Um, but so if you, if you skip, yeah. Um, so we've done that already, I guess. If we can go to the, yeah. So we can do it again. <laughs> Uh, Maybe you change your mind over over the presentation. <laughs> okay, can you fill up again? I think it'd be curious um, just to understand if people's, uh, maybe somebody who is out there can kind of explain whether or not um, based on kind of a, like at this kind of fairly, um, you know, brief introduction to these narratives where that, that's changed the way they think about centralization or government intervention, how they think about the current state of cyberspace. Um, I think that personally would be quite interesting. Yeah, two people change their mind with the how you describe the current state. Well, somebody certainly thinks that government intervention is <laughs> okay. There's there's an outlier, I suppose, on the government intervention track. Uh, 
Whereas here we're sort of, oh, what just happened? Um, there seems to be very, very, there seems to be fairly tight conversions on where we want to be, which makes sense given the, the audience, I suppose, right? Because if you ask the, the, this kind of question at Deep Web Camp, you're going to get something even f further skewed. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that uh, people aren't interested in more, let's say, um, government intervention. Um, because I, I think of us as like a fairly progressive group, right? Um, and if we agree, and certainly let's say like the first question that we pose in this presentation, um, should internet companies be regulating themselves or should government be regulating sort of content? There, there seemed to be much more of a 50%, right? People here were half and half. But at least at this stage of the presentation, um, when we think about government intervention generally, uh, we don't think of it as seemingly a very good thing, which is curious to me. And maybe that, that will hopefully be sort of like, we'll be able to tease that out over the course of the, the rest of the workshop. Um, so that's been too much time here. Um, uh, this is, uh, I'll just take over for a second uh, for Puma. Um, this is a question I was asking um, because basically uh, as Prima just did, she introduced two axes, like um, uh, this idea of centralization uh, slash versus decentralization and a question of like government intervention or no government intervention. Um, but obviously there are lots and lots of different ways that you could compare different narratives. Um, and that's important because it allows us to understand, well, how are these narratives really different? Um, and also it kind of helps us identify what we actually care about, right? Um, so I want to encourage, I mean, this, this will take a little bit more time and we can come back to this later. Um, but I do want to encourage people to think a little bit about what aspect of the internet do you actually care the most about? Um, and how would you use that to compare or evaluate these, their, these different narratives? Um, at least insofar as like, which one do you think is most, most appeals to you? Um, as a participant of the internet and as a kind of a thinker in this, um, in, of these questions. Um, yeah, and with that, um, I think we can kind of open it up to a more, uh, just a to more unstructured discussion. Um, there's also, so I think what we do here is, uh, we'll kind of like answer some questions at first. I also wanna, before that though, I wanna introduce people to this other uh, technological tool that we wanted to try out, um, at least for me, this is my first time hosting a um, uh, online workshop. So I want to give, uh, wanted to try this, oh, where is this? Actually, I can certainly share my screen first. So there is a whiteboard software called Moreau I want to give people a chance to try logging on and see if they can actually uh, test it out or see if it works. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to use this whiteboard as a way of just like um, interacting with each other a little bit more um, in a more structured way. So if you just go to that website, uh, which is currently in the Zoom chat, and you should be able to directly access and play around with this whiteboard. Oh, yeah, okay, excellent. I see people logging in. Um, and if you can't, it's okay. Um, you should still be able to see uh, my screen share and we'll be kind of just using this as a basic, uh, uh, well, whiteboard or canvas on which we can sort of like record some of our conversation. Um, but first, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start by moderating a little bit. Um, at the very top, uh, okay, so Juan's been answering questions, so perfect. <laughs> yes, Michael was asking, uh, is the question not a little binary? Um, uh, so Michael, maybe you can sort of, um, uh, we can open up with that, or you can explain exactly what you mean there, since it seems like you're clarifying a little bit further down. Um, yeah, just uh, binary in the sense, and, and um... I guess you, you did touch on the other 
models of governance, whether it be more libertarian or, or otherwise. But the, the question that was posed in the sort of quiz, as it were, binary in the sense that either the government should intervene and moderate and, and control these spaces, or it should be, you know, large corporations. And both of those, uh, you know, as we currently stand, don't have many opportunities for real tangible citizen intervention, as it were, as in they're not very democratic. And I think we're, we're aware of that. Um, so I guess binary in the sense that, you know, is there not another way? Uh, a lot of those ways we have been talking about in this conference, um, I guess, in terms of, you know, more, more sort of human interaction and participation in the actual governance of these platforms. And I think we're all discovering how we might do that as we go along. Um, but if we sort of stick in the mindset of, oh, it should be either the market or the government. No, no, absolutely. And that, that was exactly what uh, has driven us to, to, to draft, but we decided not to because there is too, way too many um, manifestos being drafted. But we are thinking about drafting this declaration of interdependence because indeed it's not about pure uh, governmental intervention, pure corporate actors or what, what else is actually everything is so intertwined that uh, the, the only way that you, that you can actually have some type of governance is by making sure that every stakeholders have a say into, into something. So of course, like the, the, the axes are super binary because we actually looked for axes. <laughs> um, they might not be the right axis and, and like, please, if you have other, uh, like we probably we should have had a multidimensional <laughs> Uh, graph, but that, that's harder to design. Uh, but if you have like ideas of other or better axes, uh, absolutely let's discuss that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a very difficult one to, to choose two axes. I just wonder whether, I'm not sure I've got the alternative because you're right, it's a very difficult question to answer, but whether those two axes should be uh, yeah. government and corporation, whether they could move more into the field of sort of you know, kind of anarchy and order or chaos and order or freedom. And yeah, and we took those axes because we were trying to place the identified narratives uh, on, on, on a flat space, on a two-dimensional space. Uh, um, it's quite possible that there are other narratives that would be better uh, qualified through different axes. And the idea through the workshop is actually to try and find other narratives that we might not have mentioned and, uh, and then see whether we can locate them there or whether we need a, a third dimensional axis. Yeah, I love a thing. It's a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, originally I was just thinking because um, uh, part of the inspiration for, uh, uh, certainly from, for, the, for the written sort of um, homework on the declarations of cyberspace um, was original, so there's this, um, what was it called again, the Ur, one that Urs wrote, um, published by Berkman, um, on digital constitutionalism, um, which kind of reviewed a trove uh, or kind of a, a, like a extensive list of different um, constitutions and manifestos um, that articulated different, like let's say, digital rights, uh, this idea that you know, there is a list of rights that should be sort of safeguarded uh, on the internet. Some of them are more sort of government, inter most of them are sort of lean more toward government intervention of some sort. Um, some do not. Um, but it's just really exciting, um, I'd say like, what I think of it as a data set. And they specifically say it is like, there are so many manifestos and declarations out there um, that they can't actually um, even uh, discuss so they really cut it off as like uh, there is a set of institutional manifestos or sort of documents. They're, those are the ones that people that they are willing to analyze. Um, but in effect, you know, like they're sort of saying things like John Bar John Perry Barlow's the Declaration of Independence do not actually count in this since uh, uh, that declaration was by a single person. Um, so I, I guess I it's it's really interesting to sort of think about these sort of internet manifestos as a kind of data set and try to identify what kind of patterns are there. Um, how do I, how can I sort of think about uh, or compare the different approaches and the different values expressed in these manifestos? Um, 
and I guess like one like thing that really like developed, uh, I think Prima sort of mentioned this earlier is that, you know, in the earlier workshop, so we're talking about like different notions of the web, what the web is currently like in terms of the web 2.0 and how we can get to um, something like the web 3.0. Um, and one of the challenges that uh, I certainly I heard um, from various speakers at the workshop um, was this question of like, well, what are like, how do I generate a narrative for the web 3.0? How do I have something uh, that's so convincing, uh, that's so, uh, uh, that really like brings on board a larger swath of the public that sort of like gives them insight into the values of this movement of like why people care. Um, and also like we had um, like a commissioner of the FCC there and she said that like this is important because if you want to convince any policymakers, if you want to convince governments to support this kind of effort, uh, you're going to have to really pose it at that level you know, at that really gut level. Um, and all of these narratives that we kind of articulated, they, they have that gut level feel, right? They say, this is the value. These are the, in some sense that they kind of pose it, it's a hero, this is a villain, this is the victim, right? Um, and we see, uh, I think, a need for narratives uh, for the, <laughs> we got some Berliners, good. <laughs> um, uh, for that kind of, um, for the deep web or for whatever new narratives might emerge, uh, might be necessary for the future of the web. Um, so, okay, we have some productive chaos, I hope, and people are sort of familiarizing themselves with the sticky note. That's awesome. Uh, I'm gonna move slightly over here. And okay, uh, uh, first off, I wanna be clear. Uh, if people have questions at any point, this is like, well, what are we? We're like, we're 13 people in the room. This is fairly intimate. It's fairly casual. Um, it's an opportunity, I think, for us to have an interesting discussion about where, um, I guess, where our collective action could be, how we could uh, bring forward or develop uh, these new narratives for the internet. Um, so, ah, what did I just do? Um, so, yeah pop up if with questions, with just like sort of ideas and um, or reactions to whatever you might be seeing. So I thought uh, just to sort of help structure that discussion. Um, uh, once again, so we're back at this graph that we've been sort of seeing throughout sort of at various points uh, uh, during this discussion or uh, during this workshop. Uh, this sort of tiny little this diagram where we're talking about centralization and state intervention. And you see, um, as before, these are guesses as to where these narratives fall. And you can think of it as the, the dots on this would be like different uh, manifestos, but also different um, the positions, uh, let's say the policy positions of various entities, um, as well as different national policies, right? You know, let's say the US approaches in a certain way and the EU probably approaches it is, I would say, probably much more interventionist, right? At least um, according to the GDPR. I don't have, a, I just realized I don't have a little EU flag up there. Um, somebody wants to find that EU flag and paste it in there, that would be excellent. Uh, that it's just an emoji. I, actually, is the EU flag an emoji? I just realized, it might not be. It's not like a national flag. <laughs> Anyways. Um, would some enterprising and uh, courageous soul like to demonstrate uh, their vote? And they don't have to reveal themselves if they don't want to. Um, uh, try clicking and dragging one of these uh, little buttons. So I'm going to encourage people to bring everyone to me. OK. Oh, OK. I see people's cursors. Oh my God. This is so fun, actually. Wow. You get to see everybody's cursors like moving. Ah, oh, I feel there's like such cool art you could do with this. Um, okay. So. I think there's a little issue with this dots. <laughs> okay, productive madness. Yes, this is exactly what I was. Like productive chaos. <laughs> I mean, 
Oh my God, what is going on? Why is this? It's not very simple to move those little things. Yeah, you kind of have to zoom in, I think. Try zooming in a little bit. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, but it's okay. It's not super simple. Okay, it's possible to. Yeah. <laughs> you have to click the very center of the button and yeah, then yeah. move it. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's just chaos. <laughs> um, a lot of me problem is like I'm sharing my screen at the same time. So let me see if I can. Well, where do you want to have the European Union flag? Uh, I don't know. Where do you think it could go? I gotta say, this is not quite as nice as a real life whiteboard. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm figuring it out. <laughs> um. We also have, I'm going to put the obvious candidates, like the Chinese flag over here in the nationalist section. I guess like one of the things, oh. so confused why this is doing this. I tried locking that. Hopefully that'll help. Oh no, I realize now. Um, yeah, okay. So these have previous been previously been locked, uh, but they somehow got unlocked for whatever reason. Okay, it should be working now. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess like this. Um, the point of this was the, to kind of recover the general structure of what we had seen before but to try to sort of give it a little bit more granularity, right? Um, to sort of see where people are and um, where they want to be. Would somebody like to, someone who's sort of like, um, uh, like to volunteer why they think um, the internet is where it is and why they think uh, the internet should be where they think it is, where, where they think it should be? Ooh. Can I say something that might not answer your question, but yeah, uh, I have a little bit of trouble between the the corporate libertarian and nationalist to understand what would be um, what would be something that it's not libertarian, but that also counts for self sovereignty and and freedom but a more interconnected type of self-sovereignty, understanding that we are not, that we are like social beings and, mm -hmm. and that the libertarian narrative, sometimes they go more towards the individualistic capitalist approach rather than um, how can we collaborate? So like I, I I think freedom, it's only possible if it's a collective freedom, because mm -hmm. then you're not being dominated by, by whatever, like you're understanding what dominates you and what controls you to then go towards a, 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 a more collaborative free space. I don't know if it makes sense. No, I think that makes complete sense. Um, and I, I think it's very much, I mean, Prima, feel free to jump in here. Um, but I have the sense that that's exactly what we were trying, like the question we were trying to answer um, with this idea of interdependence, right? Um, that we're all here, um, like some of us are, like, certainly Prima is very involved in the kind of the D-Web and the blockchain community. 
which is very much emphasizing this kind of level of decentralization. But we want to sort of acknowledge, <laughs> I think somebody put DWeb right there, um, exactly between the sort of this no state and state controlled. Um, we want to sort of like, yeah, we want to appreciate this fact that, yeah, we're not isolated people, that we do depend on each other, right? Um, and that, uh, so we're, we're kind of like, you know, in certain ways, we, we are libertarian in the sense that we don't, we're hoping for decentralization, um, but we want to respect like this many, many values. Um, I think that certainly if we like just let the market sort of handle things, like those values don't often get respected. For example, you know, respect for um, various different communities, um, promoting access to the internet uh, to sort of communities that are underserved. These are all things which are not addressed by like a hardcore market stance, which is why we think, um, uh, well, I think historically, I think is why people kind of later came to sort of resist or um, uh, why the libertarian view became like a, a less dominant um, over, the, over the lifetime of the web, over the history of the web. Yeah, I think I want, I want to reply because I think it connects to Michael's previous question as well. So when you look at the axis that says no state intervention, state intervention, you need to look at it literally just as what it says, meaning that either you want the state to be not at all involved or there is all this middle ground in which the state can be involved. That doesn't mean it's either market or state. It just means on one there is no state that can be only market or only something else. And on the other, on the other hand, there is only state. And uh, so personally, I find myself in the middle in the sense that I think the state should be part of the conversation because we are in this interdependent thing. It, it doesn't mean I want this to be half controlled by the corporate and half controlled by the part of them should be part of the conversation, including civil society, including all other types of stakeholders that we can imagine. Right. So to me, like, and I think like it's just really hard to qualify this axis, and we, we discussed it for a lot of time. But I don't think it 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 will be. It would be, it's dangerous if, if it's not properly interpreted as, as just being like this. On one hand, it means like state has no say, like we don't listen to the state on the extreme no state intervention. On the other hand is we listen only to the state. But then there is all those multiple possibilities in between. And again, I think ideally it would be three dimensional so that we could have, for instance, um, community based, uh, governments or NGOs or civil society that but those are those are actually in between those two extremes if they well they could be depending on how much power they want to give to the state either all nothing or some right so as long as you if you acknowledge that the state should have some kind of influence even a little bit then you move away a little bit from the pure libertarian narrative um, and so the, the interventionist one, which is the big one, um, it's, it's actually um, like it doesn't mean state intervention. It really just means pot potentially like the DWeb community to me is to some extent interventionist, but it's interventionist in the sense that it's about the web community, the, the internet actors that needs to get involved and actually govern this infrastructure, right? So it's, it's not libertarian because libertaria will say, just leave the market be. Whereas the DWeb community is actually much more understanding that there needs to be some form of governance, some form of uh, uh, either self-regulation or regulation that is not just market driven. To add to that, for example, there are interventions that are um, quite popular among some of these groups, like net neutrality, for example, where uh, many people expect the government to step in and tell, for example, internet service providers, you can't discriminate between these two types of traffic, right? So there are government interventions um, that are somehow 
like uh, negative freedoms in, in, in some way, in that they ensure that some actors aren't impinging on your freedoms. There are other types of government intervention that might be a bit more directed in terms of uh, the traditional example in the US is how the Chinese government, for example, enforces content moderation decisions, right? Which in the US is, is not a thing. So we can think of intervention at many layers within the internet stack, but also within those layers, there are many types of government interventions that, that could take place. Yeah. And that's why the interventionist is, is so, uh, so stretched out within this uh, type of, uh, within this graph. Could I just ask, uh, is, a lot, a lot coming out there, but and I don't know. Yeah, clearly, you, you guys have thought about this uh, a lot, and I do understand what you're, um, what you're, you're saying about why you chose the axes. But I wonder, maybe, maybe even the confusion in my head is because perhaps we're using almost two different types of of, of values on the two different axes. So on the one hand, we're using a, a kind of more I don't know how to describe, like a concrete entity or an example of this. So i.e. the state. And there's another debate about what what we mean by the the state, but I assume you mean kind of the nation state. And then on the other hand, you've got a, a, the other vertices, which is kind of centralization and decentralization, which is a more kind of broad, almost philosophical value. So you've got two different kind of types of axes almost, which maybe that's where the confusion is. Initially on my side thinking, oh, is it either government or is it either corporation? And it lends into what um, Livia was saying maybe about this idea of freedom in the sense that you know, freedom comes from a kind of balance between uh, order and chaos and tyranny and, 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 and anarchy is that we all have to collectively agree to some form of order, which in itself is a form of tyranny, but it's one that we all chose together democratically. And hence why maybe, you know, you were saying that you maybe went for a position more in the middle, which to me makes perfect sense, because I guess that's where this concept of freedom lies, is if you imagine the, the horizontal axes as kind of chaos and order and the vertical one is you know, libertarianism and, and autark autarky down the bottom like freedom would be bang in the middle I, I guess I'm just thinking out loud here and then we can think about I mean you mentioned several different examples of how to organize so one is the state the other one is a corporation you also mentioned civil society other online forms these seem to me to be all different examples of things that you could populate those that graph or that table with but they're slightly different to the axes. Maybe I was just getting confused about the idea of the, the state as an example of this rather than a kind of something that kind of fits in the graph. I'm not sure if that made any sense whatsoever, but uh, it seems like the, the no state intervention and the state controlled leaves a lot of holes in there as to what do we mean? What do we mean by, by the state, if that makes any sense? <laughs> I mean, you could, you could take the same axis that instead of saying no state intervention, state control, it could have been corporate. It could have been like no corporate intervention and corporate so, control. Right. It would be another you know, example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, one axis is about the technology. So it's not philosophical, it's actually very technical. It's very practical, like is the technology centralized or decentralized at the infrastructure level? And the other one is the governance. But mm -hmm. the governance, like we didn't, like we, we just pick the state because, because it, kind of, it kind of fit well with the narrative that we had identified. Yeah. Uh, but the question is really like, while you have a particular type of infrastructure, how do you govern? The other axis is, is like the governance type, right? And, uh, and, and please let's think about what will be a better governance axis um but it's, it's difficult to it's difficult to find an axis that will enable us to locate those different narratives but if you have i'm not sure like chaos and order <laughs> yeah no i mean i'm just thinking a lot it's just it's, 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 it's like do you want governance or not governance right but uh, um i i will think that everybody wants governance it's just that some people want market-driven governance and other want uh, government governance, you know what I mean? So, I, I, I mean, yeah, maybe some people would just say like, we don't want no governance at all, but the market is a form of governance. 
fight. So the right. libertarians actually are pro-governance. They just believe in market-driven governance. So I guess like maybe like crypto anarchists, but even crypto anarchists, <laughs> uh, the blockchain people actually are, are about technologically driven governance, which is a very strong governance, right? So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this axis will be. And I completely agree with you. It's not the, it's not the best one. Uh, but I cannot think of another one. Yeah, so we're, we're totally open to, to, you know, tinker with these things. We thought it, it was an interesting way to, to put it, both because people kind of know what the government or the state is, most people, um, but also because a lot of, in descriptive terms, a lot of the people do speak in terms of the government, right? Barlow speaks against the government. He says, you have no place here, governments of iron and steel and, and, and so and so. Uh, whereas I think when you listen to what government officials within the EU say about uh, the internet, they, of course, because they're government representatives, uh, speak about that. But when the media talks about uh, the internet in the EU, they really you know, pay attention to, to this idea of government intervention to, say, protect privacy. Uh, and they pose it as if it's a battle between, you know, the EU and these big corporations. And that's the narrative that is that is going on. I don't have anything in favor or against, but it, it seems to be a powerful narrative that or a lens through which a lot of people are seeing what's going on. Um, whereas I don't have much experience with China, but I imagine that same thing. There is this very powerful lens of the government enabling certain infrastructure and enabling for people to do certain things, but at the same time, uh, to keep harmony, so to speak, uh, they need to limit certain other things. But it seems like a, a very vivid uh, component. Um, I would like to add that uh, one of the things that this chart reminds me of is uh, something that I was exposed to from um, a generative justice research group. Um, so Ron Eagleash, which I know Prima Bear shared a stage with at the Cab City Summit, um, has a, a similar chart where uh, he has uh, you know, um, traditional uh, capitalists on one side of uh, the spectrum uh, and you know, state uh, control in terms of uh, you know, the Soviet Union or communism on the other spectrum. But then in his thesis, he speaks of uh, the bottom-up social organization of indigenous uh, folks based on the eastern seaboard of, of North America, uh, specifically the, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee. And uh, he, he, he mentions that this may offer a, an orthogonal to this spectrum uh, uh, point to, to, to kind of uh, focus on, to, to also touch on this point of where freedom lies on a chart like this. It may be orthogonal to, to you know, spectrums that we are familiar with. And um, this is also something I know and have been deeply inspired by in, in terms of Prima Bear speaking of these things and the clandestine talk um, uh, some time ago. And uh, the idea of you know, how do we avoid the, the pitfalls of you know, uh, conventional uh, you know, organization, you know, it's so easy and, and these, these concepts are so ubiquitous. You know, how do we authentically come off of this, uh, you know, more conventional spectrum. And so I actually have been able to come into contact with uh, the, the very indigenous uh, folks that Iglash references in his thesis, who've only been available for like the last three years. But for the last year, I've been sitting in these uh, very historical councils and, and working groups with this, with this indigenous group. And uh, I can see a whole lot of transformative power uh, in, in their approach to, to social organization, uh, especially with this, this firsthand uh, experience uh, over the, the last uh, year. So these are some of the things that uh, I've been thinking about and we've been working on uh, with Blockstack, uh, which is a blockchain uh, 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 company, uh, PVC, that's focused on uh, restructuring internet architecture uh, and, and moving the control to the users. And so uh, we've been working on combinations of uh, this in indigenous approach um, with uh, some some possibilities with mids and DAOs in the blockchain space uh, and utility chains and commons and, and, and playing with uh, with these ideas and seeing if we can come up with some some viable models to 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 get to an adequate social layer, which is 
been also a deep inspiration of mine uh, since seeing Primavera on that, that Fab City Summit um, that stage. So this is something that this, this chart reminds me of uh, from the, the introduction to this uh, very um, comprehensive generative, generative justice research group's work. Well, I would say by my side that uh, regarding the, the uh, how to deal with the governance of the internet, we have a very classical approach uh, that because we have been regulating many other things before. We have been regulating the financial system. We have been regulating the infrastructure of electricity, uh, railways, all this stuff. So we have a theory on this. Um, for example, uh, historically, people have been very open to uh, have a um, very individualistic approach to things like, for example, the flow of information, where you suppose that if you don't like something to be read or to be exposed, you can always uh, shut the, close the, the, the channel and do something else. But uh, so, so there are classical arguments in favor of a very uh, laissez-faire approach, laissez approach to anything related to the, uh, to the flow of information, to freedom of expression. For example, the, the US Supreme Court is extremely, is a very extremist defending uh, the First Amendment. Uh, you have, uh, for example, in the United States, uh, a Supreme Court that considers that um, more or less every ca you can say anything, and it's very difficult uh, if you don't go for for a straight incitement to put a person into jail for something he has said. Or, or you know, this is a, and this is very much embedded in the judiciary, in the American judiciary. And on the other hand, uh, of course, there are some things, for example, platforms that look to be very similar to utilities. And probably we should think about uh, deal with them as we deal with other utilities. We, we, we are not expected them to, to extract any kind of value from their work. Uh, we don't allow the electricity firms or, for example, the water supplying companies to have unlimited profits. We expect them to cover costs and to remunerate capital. And when you see that they go beyond that, uh, you have a look and go for some kind of uh, either regulation or nationalization or anything like that uh, in order to avoid the destruction of the ecosystem of, uh, of the medium and uh, or the enterprises that work with them. So you don't want them to have unchecked power. Uh, and the other way around, you, you regulate these kind of things because there are scale economies there. So I would say that um, we have theory about how to deal with these things and we should always try to take care of, to have an idea of, of how this has worked something. The internet is not different. It's simply a, a, a special kind of market and in economic theory, it works for more or less everything. Um, if I can jump into that, I think, I think there is like one challenge, right, is that um, while it's easy for one government to regulate its own facilities uh, because they are within its own jurisdiction. Um, one government can regulate one online operator to the extent that they operate within their jurisdiction, but they cannot operate the, the others, right? And because the internet is transnational by, by, its, um, by its infrastructure, then either we need to adopt like a Chinese model in which we lock down the internet so that we have full control and regulation over which content gets in and out. Uh, and then you can regulate your local operators and prevent users from accessing information from the outside. But if you stay within an open internet, it's extremely difficult for just one government to exercise they would exercise on, their, on, on other type of facilities, right? And that's where the whole question of internet governance comes in. Like it, it has to be uh, global governance and, uh, and because there are those operators that, that, that exist and operate from the outside, then you need like some kind of concerted action or some other type of a governance mechanism in order to ensure that everyone is complying with those rules. I'm very, I, 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 this is something that is often said, and I have my doubts about that in the following sense. 
If you try to control the flow of information, you are in that situation. It's impossible for governments or very difficult or you need the, the Chinese wall. But the majority of internet firms do operate in the real world and can be regulated in the real world. You have Uber, you can regulate Uber as much as you can because it's not a matter of the, of the, of the cell phones or the computers. Uber happens in the real world. You, you decide what to do about that. You, you can regulate Uber, you can regulate Globo or other firms, for example. You can regulate Amazon very easily. They, can, they have to, to reach a deal with any government in the world because they cannot sell in your territory if you don't. You, you, you have atoms and bytes, and it's almost impossible to control bytes. But people that are working with bytes normally want to use bytes to control atoms. So in the atom side, you can always intervene. I also yeah. thought it was interesting how you were talking. Sorry, Prima, did you want to? No, 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 go ahead. I was just thinking that with the arrows, we have this idea of how things are and how things should be. And you were talking about how some companies have become kind of key infrastructure. So how we could think of like what, say, Facebook is and what Facebook should be uh, in the same way. And it would be interesting to see what people would classify as, you know, quote unquote, electricity. Um, and, and to think of some of these, uh, because I think that's part of where the debate is, is going these days. Of, and, you know, in the US, Elizabeth Warren was taking very much that stance and saying some of these corporations have become uh, public utilities, and we need to deal with them in that way, which is, you know, one of one of many approaches. But I think within these conversations, it would also be very interesting to see what people think, uh, which of these uh, platforms should be operating as a proper platform, so to speak, uh, a regulated utility that is providing, you know, a, a neutral service. Um, and many people have argued, for example, that uh, search should be something like that, where um, it's not profit driven. Um, I guess something I just want to react to, um, to what Harold um, was talking about um, uh, with respect to kind of indigenous peoples, uh, is this, I, I, first off, I, I love um, his comment because it's it kind of it, it drives home to me how problematic or how do I say it? So there's a sense in which yes, clearly this uh, this two-dimensional uh, representation does not capture what um, is truly out there um, or all the ways we could really be uh, analyzing these narratives. But there's also this second sense, and I think it's it's something that's in much stronger to me is this that these current narratives, these corporate libertarian interventionist nationalists, they clearly don't cover um, the things that we, you know, certainly uh, I feel collectively he, even here in this room really care about. They don't represent kind of the narrative that I think we hold in our heads or that we want the internet to look like. And this, um, these two dimensions and sort of the broader kind of um, the document that the essay uh, that we sent out is broadly speaking, it's like an effort to try to figure out what are the gaps between these existing narratives? Why does it feel kind of like not right? And what do we really mean when we say like we want interdependence as a kind of, um, as Prima and Juan have talked about, or we want sort of like to promote uh, more indigenous interests or when other groups um, like Color of Chain sort of um, articulate the need for these uh, bringing out, bringing in these outside perspectives. There's a sense that there's like something missing in the narrative, right? Um, but exa exactly where is it missing? And like, okay, so currently, if you just look literally at the physical gaps here, there are chunks that are missing, right? We could go something that's like super nationalist and super centralized. So I'm not sure what that would mean, I guess. Um, I think maybe like there's like a global government that runs everything. Uh, is that really what we kind of want? Maybe it kind of is that would, uh, um, maybe that is how some people think the internet should be run. Um, if anybody, any of those people are in this room, I would love to hear from you. Uh, but there are other gaps as well. And if we had other dimensions, we could identify more easily what those gaps are. And um, 
uh, let me close this sort of rambling with just a sense like to me, this is like extreme, uh, to me this like, this question is extremely pragmatic, right? Because if we have an internet that we care about and we have, if we can sort of determine a vision that we can coalesce around, that's necessary for moving this project forward, right? We need to be able to articulate a vision and articulate clearly why this is different from each of these previous kind of ways of thinking about the internet if we want to create a certain kind of collective action uh, or if we want to sort of make change in policies um, along that proposal. Um, so to me, like, I want to reply to both you and Pablo at the same time, um, in the sense that I think I, I actually like, I, I would be curious to know, like in the, in the audience, if, where, where, if, if you have to pick a spot, uh, where would you put yourself? But it seems from the previous answer that most people put themselves in the libertarian, um, I'm actually, I'm slightly surprised because from the discussion we had, I think there is quite some interventionist. <laughs> um, and to me, it's like, it's, it's about how do we want intervention to happen? And, um, and so for instance, like uh, calling for a public utility or public facility and therefore requiring um, state intervention about how this public utility is operated is is one way and and that's moving on the governance layer on the governance axis but to me there is also the possibility of moving at the technological axis and uh, and by the way i think nationalists should be on the top <laughs> it's like centralized and state controlled because i actually think it's state control and decentralized becomes pretty much impossible to achieve um but what i'm saying is like so one way to intervene because there is this like large corporation is well let's uh, make sure that there is some kind of governmental regulation or other type of regulation and that means we keep the infrastructure as it is and we change the governance structure but we can also imagine for instance like the discourse about breaking down those corporation the discourse is about uh, enforcing interoperability so that we can bring back a level playing field and so forth so and that's interventions at the, at the infrastructure level, if you like, All right? We don't really change the way in which governance happens, but we change the structure, we change the architecture of those, um, all, all those system. And so to me, like, when we're, when we're thinking now, because we are looking into this uh, dual axis system, we have this tendency of like thinking more on the governance axis, but I, I'm, I'm particularly interested more in the, um, technological axis and, and again I think centralization decentralization is one axis I think another axis could be um, walled garden versus full interoperability you know open protocol versus a proprietary platform and that's that's yet another axis that people that we can intervene on that we can um, so to me like it's it's I mean it's, it's extremely complex but the, the visualization does not really give uh, credit to the complexity of the question. You know what I mean? So like you can, you could, you could keep the, the current governance, but by changing the infrastructure, you're actually completely changing the way in which the, the platform will be governed. I can um, jump in here. I was thinking that the differences between the the governance types of corporation and nation state and maybe somehow libertarian not that much is that um it's the centralization of how the decisions are being made and and how far they are reaching and i feel like what the the decentralized web governance is bringing is is more community owned, uh, users owned decision making. So, so the type of governance is is decentralized from its root. So that could become like the model for all of them. Like corporations could have 
um, corporations could have eventually uh, users uh, ownership, uh, like how this centralized entities could become decentralized and not lose so much uh, their form, like how nations could could have more participatory decision making corporations as well and and how the libertarian move could be more um, interconnected between the 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 freedom of expression of each one of the companies that exist. Yeah, just to add to that, if, if I may, I think, uh, yeah, that touches on quite an interesting point is that the, all of these elements in this chart we've got here, whether it's state or corporation or, or the internet or, you know, civil society, whatever, they obviously don't exist in isolation. They all affect each other. So I guess what you, unless I'm wrong, Livia, what you're saying is that, you know, we're assuming the certain model of the corporation and the state, but that likely will and hopefully will change. And so you could have a model whereby you had high state intervention, which as it currently stands would sound very kind of authoritarian, but if the state itself has now become more democratic in a sense, then you effectively end up with the same conclusion. If you change nothing about the governance of, of the internet in, within itself, but change everything about the governance of the state and we're more involved in the state and then the state as in us makes a decision on how the internet should be governed you end up in the same position so it's i understand the challenge of this table because it's almost impossible to separate out the different different elements really yeah i, I tend to agree with um the more recent comments here as uh, also exposed uh, through this general justice research group um about the ways you know technology and social economics co-constitute one another and they even introduced this they apply this in, in the realm of chaos theory and basins of attraction that we should uh, be aware of um, and and so yeah it, it, to, to try to separate these things uh, you know can it seems like it's a it's a dangerous dangerous thing to not to not think in a, in a systems design and engineering way uh, when, when having these very uh, complex and interdisciplinary uh, conversations. Well, I wanted to do a last remark that, uh, that I think that the, 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 the separation between the atoms and the bytes is the critical message I want to, to go through because I'm very, I'm fairly libertarian regarding the bytes part. I'm not in favor of much uh, control over things like Google or Facebook. They deal on, they mainly deal on bytes, and that's something that governments really cannot com control without destroying the first, the the, the, liber the freedom of expression, which is the main liberty for any democratic system. So, control, trying to control the, the flows of bytes is fairly dangerous, very difficult, and you end up uh, with something that is mainly unworkable. But you can, uh, but of course, when 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 internet goes beyond the flow of data or the flow of information, and it goes very fast, um, there you can do a lot of things, and you have, and, and of course, we, we have governments for some reasons. So my view, one of the things is that the the, the declaration of independence of cyberspace was more sens sensible than it looked when you read in the first the first time, because what he was uh, what uh, it was said there was that taking into account the fact that this world of information is to some extent orthogonal from the society as a whole. So allow us to be free regarding information. And then, of course, it doesn't mean that you are free for everything. You are free in the information movement. When you go to the, real, to the physical, when you, are, when you are Google, you are free, okay. But when you are Amazon, sit down, and reach a deal with your government because you need physical infrastructure that is in charge by physical government. National governments are totally impotent when they try to control flows of bytes, but they are not impotent at all 
when they work in the physical space where they have a control of territory. So it's a, I think there is a substantial orthogonality there to use. I think I think the, the distinction atom and bits is uh, is a is a nice is a nice one, but I think that um, when you talk about the declaration of independence, in my view at least, uh, Barlow was not talking about company being free from governmental intervention. He was talking about people being free to operate into this space. And today, at least, because of this corporate power, there is hardly any freedom. Because even though you're free from the government, you're not free from Google and Facebook, which are controlling the way in which I can interact. Right? So um, I, don't, I don't see at all uh, the declaration of independence as being like a corporate narrative as much as a libertine, as much as being focused towards individual freedoms and civil liberties, right? And, and the problem today is that how do you ensure these civil liberties? Uh, like how do you actually make sure that we are free to act on the internet um, and that we are not controlled by corporate and that we are not controlled only and fully by governmental actor, but actually that we can find this new space of freedom. And I think that was what uh, Barlow was advocating for. And, and the problem is that there is this compromise because at, at the moment there seems to be, and, and I hope it's not a dichotomy, but at the moment there seems to be like this clash between either we're controlled by corporates or we're controlled by corporates which are controlled by governments. <laughs> Or we're controlled by government platform if they create those, you know. So it's it's really about like you know, like today, like it seems that we used to see like the, the government was regulating directly people, and now the government is almost protecting us from the regulation of private sector of platforms. So it's like the, the, the governmental intervention, I think that's why there is actually a lot of people that, that are on the side of Barlow in terms of we want to which are highly interventionist because they want the government to intervene on the private sector in order to ensure that the regulation that is done by the private sector is such as to ensure civil liberties. You see what I mean? But, you know, I think that the, at this stage, companies are more often uh, considered, they, they have more pressure to limit liberty than to allow it. No? They, they don't look to be, that, that they, are, they are very much pressured to, to control, for example, like expression. If you ask to, let's take the case of Facebook. Of course, they, they have made very disgusting things regarding privacy, but in terms of censorship, for example, they are they are often considered to be too much less fair and a little bit uninterested. So it is not that they try to control too much. No, we, we don't. I don't see the, the big tech companies uh, that deal with with data to be especially interventionist. The other way around, perhaps, is even they are more guilty of be too much less fair. Yeah, I think. I mean, it depends what you mean by less fair, but definitely. Facebook and Google are highly moderating the content in order to make sure that they earn as much profit as possible. So yeah, it's not it's not the same type of intervention, but that's definitely interventions. That's that's true. Of course, they, they of course try to to use the, the, the. In fact, they create huge amounts of value, and they can only retrieve the value back by things like by such a, an efficient system of uh, as advertisement and. and that's clearly obvious. It doesn't work. You know? There is something that doesn't work in the advertisement model for the internet. There is Which is why I think there is an argument, and that doesn't mean that's the best solution, but I think there is an argument when we see that corporate actors are providing a service which is distorted in order to further their own interests, that we want some form of intervention on top of those, uh, of those actors in order to bring back the original civil liberties that the platforms were intended to, to provide, right? Um, and, and I think the big question, and, and we don't have an answer, but is um, what are the various ways in which 
this type of, uh, like how do we actually bring back the civil liberties? And I think governmental intervention of companies is one, and this is like this axis. Um, but I think we can, we, can, we can try and brainstorm a lot of other solutions, which are maybe not about getting the state to intervene, but maybe about getting the state not to intervene on the governance, but getting the state to intervene on the infrastructure. So for instance, the state mandating uh, some form of like uh, more interoperability between I keep saying that, but I just think it's a good example because if you if you if you were to tell Facebook instead of telling Facebook you have to you have to make your news feed in that particular manner. If, if instead the state was to say to Facebook, you have to open up and let anyone provide their own uh, newsfeed algorithm and let users choose, that's a very different form of intervention. It's not about moderating the content directly. It's more of an infrastructure intervention in order to let a market of uh, newsfeed algorithm to be able to compete on top of this essential facility that is the, the Facebook platform. So there is a lot of ways of intervention. And I think when we talk, I mean, my, my, the point I want to make here is like, when we talk about interventionism, we need to like decline so many types, not just like how to, what to intervene on, but how, which layer do we want to intervene on? And there are many different solutions, even if it's still the state intervening on the private sector, there are many layers in which the intervention can be done, which might lead to different results. I guess um, the question is, oh, sorry, sorry go, go ahead, Michael. No, go ahead, feel free. We, I guess we keep coming back to the same issue with, with all, not just this debate, but always when we talk about democracy and, and, and decentralization is, is what to do about power and concentrations thereof. So I, I really like what you're saying there about that would be an interesting or a novel form of state intervention uh, to, you know, change the, 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 the governance style of, of Facebook or, or whatever, rather than saying you should do X, Y or Z in terms of how your newsfeed operates. But, you know, that could be great. But then we've still got the problem as well, bearing in mind what a lot of people have said in the chat and previously that the the connections between the nodes of centralized power, as in corporations and government, and the individual human beings in there have personal and business relationships, etc. Not to sound too conspiracy theory, but how are we as citizens to then kind of still end up in the same problem as we hit this kind of wall of power, as in, you know, we as citizens want the government to do this to the corporations, but then we still face a bit of a deficit there in terms of how that comes about. And I wonder whether we might have to kind of use the internet in a way to over overcome that problem. And this goes back to what, you know, Harold was saying about systems thinking and how all the different elements of that chart interact is that the, the very act of talking about how we govern the internet, if that, if we can come up with a system that is in itself more democratic, then that also changes how democratic the state is, how democratic the, the corporation is. But it's just how to get around this kind of the, the wall of concentration of power, whether it lies in the state or the corporation or online is, is the kind of perennial problem. And, and it, I know that kind of Buckminster Fuller quote is, you know, over quotes, let's say, but kind of building alternatives rather than trying to fight the, the system as it is. Yeah, I'm not giving any answers here, I, I appreciate, but uh, yeah, it's just we keep going back to the same problem, I guess, wherever we look. I don't know. You uh, have succinctly captured many of my frustrations, Michael. So thank you. <laughs> um, so with that, I just want to let people, um, it is, we're at the 6.30 a.m. mark or the 90 minute mark. Um, so give people an opportunity to uh, head out. Uh, this marks the official end of the workshop, but the, um, I think there will be many, obviously there are many, many questions remaining. Um, just as this workshop um, was a continuation of a previous one, um, we believe there will be more conversations, for example, um, at the webcamp, uh, hopefully next year, as well as in other sort of online venues, just to try to raise 
um, awareness about the need for these narratives, about what kinds of possible solutions there are to internet governance, whether new ones or just ones people haven't noticed. And hopefully uh, this particular conversation will be part of that kind of like, uh, I think what Michael was gesturing at is the search for uh, some sort of collective action, some way that we can get together as uh, citizens to, I guess, resist or somehow counteract or counterbalance uh, the corporate power and the sort of governmental power that already exists out there. So yeah, just wanna thank everybody for joining us here and participating. This has been awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay in touch. Thank you, Kanye. Thank you all. Thank you.